Good day. Over the last few hours, there have been somewhat incoherent reports about another Russian missile strike on Ukraine. The very last uh, report that I've read suggests that 32 Russian missiles were launched at Ukraine overnight. I should stress these are Ukrainian claims, and the Ukrainians also claim that they shot down 16 of these missiles, which, by the way, would mean that another 16 uh, um, reached their targets, presumably, which would suggest a sharp and dramatic decline in Ukrainian effectiveness if, of course, you believe Ukrainian claims, routine claims, that they shoot down 90% of Ukrainian, of Russian missiles, cruise missiles launched at them, which, of course, I don't. But anyway, apparently a big cruise missile strike last night. There was also reports of Geranium 2 drones being used, and there's also some hints that there's been more Ukra uh, Russian missile strikes across Ukraine taking place as I'm making this video and perhaps over the course of the day. I'm going to, as I always do, wait until there's a little bit more information and a little bit more clarity about what is going on before I discuss this particular missile strike. Clearly something has happened and is perhaps still happening, but I don't think it's possible for the moment to say exactly what its scale is and what its purpose is and what its effect is. Anyway, to move on, yesterday I said that there'd been a dearth of information about what was going on in and around Bakhmut, the main focus of the battle, the Battle of Donbass, which is the big battle of this war. And I said that I expected that there would be more information today. And sure enough, there is. And there's now lots of reports that fighting is going on in and around Paraskovievka. This is this other village just to the west of Krasnaya Gora, which the Russians captured a few days ago. Krasnaya Gora being on a height. It's high ground, close to... Uh, Paraskovievka, it enables the Russians to shell Ukrainian positions in Paraskovievka, which is apparently what they're doing, and that there's, they've largely managed to surround Paraskovievka, and that there's now actual fighting going on in the village itself. Though again, it's not always easy to get a full picture of what's going on, and one gets contradictory reports, and sometimes things that are reported and which seem reliable get denied and refuted later. But anyway, it does seem as if there is now a major fight going on for Paraskovievka. By the way, and incidentally, I saw one report which I would regard as being low reliability, but I pass it on for what it's worth, that there are as many as one and a half thousand Ukrainian troops in Paraskovievka. I think this is unlikely. The place looks too small to me, from what I can understand about it from the maps, for there to be that number of Ukrainian troops there. I suspect we're talking about an actual Ukrainian force, which is only a fraction of that size. But anyway, it does look as if there are still Ukrainian troops in Paraskovievka, that they're largely surrounded, but they're still able to put up an organized resistance, and they're cle clearly fighting um, bravely and intensively for the village. There are also, however, further reports, and these look significantly more reliable, that the Russians, or at least, shall I say, the Wagner assault forces, because that's what we're talking about, have now pushed beyond Paraskovievka, that they've actually physically occupied part of the road leading from Bakhmut to Slavyansk. This is one of the roads that, you know, passed through this particular area near Krasnaya Gora and Paraskovievka that I've been talking about in the past. And that the Russians, 
or shall we say again, the Wagner assault groups, are now pushing from the north, interestingly, they're swinging from the north, southwestwards, towards Chasov Yar, so that we now have, or so it seems to me, two Russian forces, or two pincers, closing in on Chasov Yar, one from the southwest, which is, or rather, it's the southeast pushing westwards, which passes through Ivanovka or close to Ivanovka, moves towards Chasovia, one from the north. If you are to believe these reports, which on, on balance I do, and apparently there's a particular settlement that lies between the Russian forces pushing down from the north. Um, and Chasovia, and this particular settlement is now the next target of the Russians. And the view is that if this particular settlement is captured, then that will also essentially close Ukrainian use, finally, of that other road, the road to Konstantinovka, which has been the Ukrainians' main supply route into Bakhmut, as all of the other roads and roadways are gradually cut. Now, about a day or so ago, I saw a map um, which I suspect comes from Prigozhin's organization, though I'm not completely certain of the provenance. Anyway, this map appeared to show access routes into Bakhmut that could be used by the Ukrainians. And it suggested that there is a, certainly at least one road, which is, as I said, this road from Konstantinovka, which is accessible to the Ukrainians, but it also made claims that the Ukrainians could still send troops and supplies into Bakhmut along country lanes and dirt tracks, and that it would be comfortable, that was the word used, for the Ukrainians to also enter and exit Bakhmut across fields. Now, I have to say on this issue, without being any sort of military expert, but based on my own experience in logistics and civil logistics, I should say, I think that this is a little far-fetched. Um, it seems to me that if you're going to keep thousands of men fighting in, you know, in, engage in constant fighting, properly supplied and fed and provided with ammunition and fuel, then realistically you need to supply them along proper surfaced roads. You can use country lanes up to a point, but I doubt very much that you can keep supplies running across fields. And if, of course, the weather turns what mild and there's rain and the fields become swampy or boggy or the ground turns soft, then any idea, it seems to me, that you can use trucks, ordinary trucks, across these fields or even trucks that have some degree of cross-country capability but which would be presumably heavily laden with supplies that you could send them across these fields, I have to say that looks to me extremely unlikely indeed. Tracked vehicles, possibly, but you don't use tracked vehicles to send supplies in. I think that would be far too expensive and labor intensive. And of course, depending on how soft the ground becomes, even tracked vehicles might run into some difficulties. So I think that this map if it really does come from Prigozhin's organisation, is intended to do what Prigozhin always likes to do. He's trying to talk up the difficulties of the battle. He says that Ukraine is actually sending reinforcements into Bakhmut. Well, maybe not him himself, but people who seem to be connected to him seem to be saying this. There's a claim, for example, that another 600 men have been fed by Ukraine into Bakhmut. That's possible, by the way, um, that Ukraine is still able to send some reinforcements into Bakhmut, which would be an illogical thing to do, but I can, I can believe 
that they might be doing it. Anyway, I can, I can understand that, but I still think that this map, if it is intended to connect it to Prigozhin's organization, is intended to do, as I said, what he always likes to do, make things appear more difficult and complex even than they actually are. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that the fight for Bakhmut is straightforward or easy or that there isn't still an awful lot of fighting or that the Russians are going to capture Bakhmut tomorrow or the day after or anything like that. We're still not at that point yet. But I think that whoever is responsible for this map, and I suspect it is Prigozhin, is trying to make it look even harder than it actually is in order that when the victory comes, he can come forward and say that it was a victory achieved against even greater difficulties and harder odds than is in fact the case. While I'm talking about Bakhmut, by the way, there's also fighting going on inside Bakhmut itself. Some videos ago, some weeks ago, I discussed the fact that there seemed to be shelling in the area, the immediate vicinity of a monument, a large monument um, consisting of a MiG-17 uh, Soviet fighter, which is on a plinth and which soars, appears to soar upwards. It's an actual MiG-17 from the early 1950s. And this particular monument has in fact been used by Ukrainian fighters um, and Ukrainian visitors. They've often taken photographs around it as they've been posted to Bakhmut. It's a sort of place where they like to be photographed. Well, the latest reports are that this area is now unsafe. It's not just that it's being shelled. That's been true for some time. It's that Russian troops, Wagner assault troops, are coming very close to it and that the fighting is reaching that part of Bakhmut. And, of course, that's important because this particular monument is in the western part of Bakhmut, or so I understand, and that gives one a sense of what is going on. Now, there's more and more reports that it looks like some sort of cauldron is developing around Bakhmut. Well, that looks increasingly likely, given the unwillingness of Ukraine to listen to advice and to pull back from Bakhmut. But that does seem to be the developing situation. If it is indeed the case that the Russians are now edging closer to the um, Bakhmut-Konstantinovka road, having now cut the bakhmut Slavyansk road, then that really is going to be a developing cauldron in Bakhmut. And of course, if they are able to push even further west, both from the north and from the south, and take Chasov Yar, then it seems to me that whatever Ukrainian troops there are still in Bakhmut are effectively trapped. And at that point, a retreat, already a very difficult proposition, especially if it's conducted again over um, dirt roads and open fields, are within sight of the Russian artillery, range of the Russian artillery, and probably under the observation of drones, Russian drones, some of which presumably have night vision devices. Well, if that is indeed the case, I suspect that a retreat is already extremely difficult. And of course, if we're looking at Russian pincers closing on Chasov Yar, then I would say it becomes effectively impossible. And we are looking at a Mariupol type scenario. So that's where we are, it seems to me, in the Battle of Bakhmut. The trap continues to close. It's not fully closed yet, but if Ukraine continues, 
to resist in Bakhmut, and of course Zelensky says that they will, then, as I said, that trap is going to take in probably thousands of Ukrainian soldiers. And I have to say, I think that is a disastrous scenario and one which I don't fully understand, but which I'm not going to discuss or, 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 or focus on further, at least in this program. Now, yesterday there were even more reports, this time in the Western media, about some sort of Russian breakthrough in the svatovo kremenaya kupiansk area. And there were more reports yesterday, um, after I made my program, which did seem to confirm that the Russians are now not just very close to Kupiansk, but that they are indeed intent on pushing the Ukrainian forces west over the Oskol River. Perhaps the plan is to set up a defence line along the Oskol River, which, by the way, would mean recapturing Kupiansk and presumably Liman at some point. Perhaps the Russian plan is to go further west and to move on and to capture places like Izium and um, Balaklia, captured by the Ukrainians during the fighting in September something which, as I discussed in my video yesterday, some Russians, some Russian officials are talking about. But I'm not going to dwell on that today. The reports are very sketchy and they're difficult to make a huge amount of sense of. But there's also been reports today that the Russians have been making further progress around Vugledar, Apparently very difficult fighting going on there, but it does seem that the Russians have been making some progress around Vugledar, and it's difficult to say exactly what that progress amounts to. As I said, it's always easy to get a complete sense of um, the nature of the fighting in any particular part of the battlefields, but that does seem to be the position at the moment that things are looking more difficult for the Ukrainians in and around Vugledar. So, we now I want to just recapitulate a little on some of the points that I made over my video yesterday in which I discussed the ammunition crisis that's now affecting um, Ukraine. And, in fact, we've also had further articles on this very topic in the Financial Times. There was a long one in the Financial Times, which actually discussed the fact that NATO officials, NATO military people, their brows are furrowing with concern about the fact that Western arsenals and Western depots of weapons are becoming dangerously depleted. <laughs> um, there's even a quote from one Western commentator, this is all in the Financial Times, about the fact that Ukraine needs weapons now and isn't getting them. We've had further vivid illustration of this fact because the German Defence Minister, Mr Pistorius, has now come forward and admitted that there aren't going to be enough Leopard 2 tanks to make up a the two battalions of Leopard 2 tanks that Chancellor Scholz was talking about um, a few weeks ago when he announced that Germany would provide Leopard 2s to Ukraine. Apparently, um, Germany is providing 14 Leopard 2s. And I, my understanding of this, by the way, uh, is that these are coming out of Germany's own military um, the, the German military is actually being asked to donate some of these Leopard 2s. Um, the only other country that is donating Leopard 2s at this time is Portugal. Poland is talking about donating 30 Leopard 2s, but these apparently will need to be refurbished, and that's going to take time, and Ukraine isn't going to see these tanks before some point in the summer. 
So the tank coalition that we were hearing so much about has failed. And of course, a couple of, about a week ago, we were hearing an awful lot about Leopard 1 tanks being supplied to Ukraine. I've already discussed that, I've explained why these tanks, these Leopard 1 tanks, um, they have thin armor. They're not but apparently the kind of tank that you would want to field in this kind of battlefield, at least not in tank versus tank warfare. Uh, Brian Balletic suggested that the plan might be to use these Leopard 1s as assault guns, rather in the way that the Russians might be using T-62s. I said that I didn't think that this is what the Ukrainians would use these tanks for, these Leopard 1 tanks for. I speculated that they would indeed be used as tanks by the Ukrainians if they were ever supplied to the Ukrainians. I'm hearing reports that I can't verify that there's problems with the Leopard 1 deliveries as well. These problems apparently relate to ammunition principally. There's apparently shortages of 105 millimeter tank ammunition. The 105 millimeter gun, which was a British gun originally, developed in the 1950s, was the main was the main tank gun for NATO tanks up to the 1980s, when it was replaced by the 120 millimeter gun, which is apparently developed principally in Germany. But anyway that the 105 millimeter ammunition is apparently, there's apparently shortages of it. Some has been produced over recent years, but it's been supplied to um, third countries outside NATO. I wonder whether some of these countries, by the way, might be Latin American countries. There's been attempts to find ammunition for these tanks it's proving very difficult to do so and if it is the latin americans who still have stocks of this ammunition well all of the latin american countries have apparently refused to provide um, weapons of any kind um, for use in the war in ukraine and president lula of brazil has apparently told President Biden himself that Brazil, at least, is going to observe a policy of strict neutrality in this war, which pre precludes its supply weapons. I've also heard reports that there's been an attempt to um, source 105 millimeter ammunition from Switzerland, but the Swiss are unwilling to supply it. I don't know whether this is true or not, by the way. Uh, if it is true, I'm guessing that it's not because of any neutrality issues. Switzerland seems to be edging away from its long-standing policy of neutrality. A massive mistake, in my opinion. A disastrous error, but that's for a further discussion some other day. But anyway, I suspect that, again, it's because even Switzerland doesn't have large stocks of this 105 millimeter ammunition and is unwilling to part with it. So the tank coalition that we were hearing so much about, well, I think it's premature to say that it's totally failed, but as far as Ukraine is concerned, it simply isn't delivering the goods in anything like the quantities that Ukraine was talking about. The Ukrainians will get some more tanks from Poland, but these are adaptations of the T-72. The Poles still have some of these T-72 tanks that they can provide Ukraine, but apparently the numbers are starting to fall and availability of these types of Soviet-era tanks or Polish produced, modernized versions of these tanks is starting to run down. So there we go, another example of the problems with weapon systems. We also see that 
the fighter, the idea of supplying fighter jets, that seems to have faded. Even Ben Wallace, the British Defence Secretary, has now suggested that this isn't really a practical idea. So, which begs the question, by the way, of why is it? Why, in that case, is Britain training Ukrainian fighter pilots? Maybe its plan is to supply these fighter jets to Ukraine after the war. But anyway, it looks as if this whole idea of supplying fighter jets is gradually fading away. And of course, the United States has told Ukraine it can't supply attackers missiles because it doesn't have enough in that case for its own needs. So we're starting to see this accumulation of problems and um, there doesn't seem to be, there don't seem to be any quick solutions to these problems. The Russians are able to crank up weapon systems, they're able to produce, mass produce uh, tanks, artillery, shells, all of those things drones as well, by the way, but the Western powers are rapidly approaching the point of exhaustion in their ability to do these things. And already we're hearing that some countries, they've already given up all their self-propelled guns, for example, to Ukraine, and they just don't have any more to spare. So, more confirmation of the thing, the points that I was discussing in my program yesterday. But I want to focus now a little again on Seymour Hersh's bombshell article about the attack on Nord Stream 2. And before I do so, I want to make one further observation. I've been getting increasingly concerned by some of the articles that I'm starting to see appearing in various places discussing Seymour Hersh's article. A lot of them, frankly, seem to me to be engaged in nitpicking, which I don't think is helpful. And I don't think they I don't think that they add anything useful to the essential disclosures that Seymour Hersh has made. There's only one article the one by um, John Helmer that actually, in my opinion, adds some useful material to the points that Seymour Hersh has made, suggesting that you know perhaps more people from more countries were informed about what was going on and that there was probably more involvement by certain other countries in the attack than Seymour Hersh acknowledges at least in the article, I think that's probably the case. But I would regard Helmer's article as supplementing, usefully supplementing, Helmer, uh, 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 Hirsch's article. I don't think it detracts from the essential information that um, Hirsch has provided. As for the other articles, well, to be honest, I think a lot of them are just nitpicking and finding small points and what they say are inconsistencies, which frankly, I don't think are either very interesting or very useful. But there have been some more recent articles which do cause me some concern and which are speculating about the identity of Seymour Hersh's source. Now that's not something I am going to do. And I don't think that's something anybody should do. I've seen one article which names a whole string of people, for example, and I think that is extremely unhelpful. I think that could potentially get someone into trouble. And the other thing it might do in the future is deter people who might want to be sources in the future from coming forward. So I am going to ask people who are doing this to stop doing it. I don't think this is useful at all, and I want this. I, w I don't want to see more articles appearing like that. So I would just like to make that point. I think we should respect 
Seymour Hersh's sources. And clearly, actually, there is more than one. There may be one main source, but it's clear that Hirsch has investigated this story carefully. I'm going to come to that in a moment. But I don't think we should try to second guess his work or try to follow up what we imagine are clues <laughs> that you know he plants as to how he recon came to this story. I think that's unwise and dangerous and frankly wrong. But Hirsch himself has now provided a very interesting article to Berliner Zeitung. And I think this is, this is a German newspaper, uh, one, by the way, which also carried an interview a short time ago with the Pink Floyd musician and polit political person, Roger Waters. Anyway, Berliner Zeitung has now interviewed Seymour Hirsch and it was a very, very interesting article indeed. And it did provide, I, th I thought, some useful additional material from Hirsch himself, which does help us form a clearer view of what actually happened. And one thing that I noticed and which stood out for me is that Hirsch says that the industry, that's to say the people who build and operate the pipelines and who were involved in the actual construction of Nord Stream 2 and the operation of Nord Stream 2, the industry does know what happened and knows who was involved. I don't mean that they know the individual people who were involved or the exact process of decision making. I don't think that's what Hirsch is trying to say, but that the industry itself has worked out and perhaps has actual information that essentially is the same, leads to the same conclusions as the one that Hirsch himself has reached about who was responsible for the attack on Nord Stream 2. So this is something that has probably been current within the industry for some time, and it probably explains certain articles that have been appearing, including one I noticed in the Washington Post a few weeks ago, in which it was saying that investigators, German investigators, have found no evidence that Russia was involved in the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines. Well, the reason that is the case, obviously, is because the industry and presumably the investigators who have been talking about things with the industry have already figured out who did in fact carry out the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines. And that wasn't the Russians. That looks increasingly, if you believe Hirsch, which I do, to have been the Americans. So I think that's an important piece of corroboration actually, if you think about it, for Hirsch's story. I've not seen any denials, by the way, from anyone in the industry that what Hirsch has just said about them is true. I've not seen anybody come forward and say, on behalf, say, of the companies involved, that actually they have absolutely no clue who was involved. Just, just saying this. Anyway... The other thing that I found interesting about what Hirsch had to say is that Hirsch discussed in passing some of the discussions between Olaf Scholz and um, the Americans when Olaf Scholz visited Washington in the run-up to the outbreak of hostilities in February of last year. Now, some people who've been reading uh, Hirsch's original article have interpreted some of Hirsch's words as saying that after Schultz wobbled, 
he was brought into line and that this means that the Americans privately briefed Schultz about their plan to carry out this attack on the on the pipelines, on the Nord Stream pipelines. I've been sceptical about this. I've said in an earlier video that I thought that was reading more into those words that Hirsch has written than the words themselves imply. And I think the Berliner Zeitung interview rather reinforces that point. I, I get the impression that Hirsch does not think that the Americans in fact, told Olaf Scholz about what they invent, intended to do. And I have to say that Scholz's behaviour when the conflict began, which was to suspend operation of Nord Stream 2, but to sort of publish hints that perhaps when things were over, uh, the pipelines might be reactivated. Um, that doesn't suggest to me that Scholz himself did expect that there would be an attack on Nord Stream 2 or had any information or clue that it would be the case. Ultimately, the very fact that an attack took place on Nord Stream 2, on, sorry, not just on Nord Stream 2, on the Nord Stream pipelines, at all, strongly suggests to me, by the way, that the Americans just didn't trust Olaf Scholz, and probably they still don't fully trust him. I mean, why otherwise blow up the pipelines unless you worry that at some point in the future the German Chancellor might decide to reactivate them? So... It doesn't look to me as if the, the Americans were going to take Schultz into their confidence. They might have, in fact, they probably did inform some of their friends in Germany about what they were going to do. But I'm going to further guess that if this whole attack was intended to disrupt a German-Russian pipeline project that it betrays essential mistrust of Germany, in which case I think that the Americans would have been extremely careful who they briefed in Germany about this attack. So I think, in general, most of the German political class and certainly most of the German business elite, were not told what was going to happen. I'm going to discuss the implications of that a little later. So I think that's one point I would clarify. But I think the focus on Germany has taken away focus from someone else. And that, of course, is Norway and certain Norwegian political leaders. And one political leader, one Norwegian politician who stands out, is, of course, Jens Stoltenberg, who is NATO Secretary General and who um, was, a, I believe, a former Prime Minister of Norway. And I believe he's a member of Norway's Labour Party. And to the best of my knowledge, Norway's Labour Party is the governing party in Norway. Now, given all these connections, and given that, according to Hirsch, the cover for this operation was provided by a NATO exercise, it seems to me that if anybody was consulted about this, or at least informed about this, in Europe, one obvious candidate is Jens Stoltenberg. Bear in mind that if you believe Hirsch, which I do, 
then the Norwegians were heavily involved. And given that Stoltenberg is a prominent Norwegian politician with close connections to the ruling party in Norway, uh, there was talk that he might return to Norway after he ended his work in NATO and become head of its central bank, for example. That was even being reported a few, week, a few months ago when his um, term as NATO Secretary General was about to end. He extended it. Anyway, given his connections in Norway, I would have thought that Stoltenberg very likely knew all about this. I say very likely. I don't pretend that I know for a fact. Very likely knew all about this attack and that he knew about this attack both from American and plausibly from Norwegian sources as well. After all, Norway was heavily involved. Now, Stoltenberg has been one of the most outspoken, fervid critics of the Russians right throughout this conflict. And of course, in the run up to the conflict, he was making all kinds of extraordinary dogmatic statements about the importance of protecting Ukraine, about um, the principle, a principle which, as far as I can see, does not exist. There's no legal basis for it, that any country that can apply to join NATO and that NATO has some kind of open door to countries that wish to join. As I said, Russia has wanted to join NATO, but it's been refused. I don't think there is any such open door policy or open door principle as Stoltenberg is talking about. But anyway, he's talked about this. He's talked about the rights of little countries. He has been very outspoken about this, that, you know, the Russians being able to block Ukraine's entry of of Ukraine into NATO would somehow impinge on the rights of small countries. All of that, I mean, he's, he's been full of all of this, both before the conflict began and after the conflict began. Well, he was saying all of that before the conflict began, even as plotting was going on to blow up Nord Stream 2, or rather Nord Stream pipelines, not Nord Stream 2, my apologies. And it looks as if, or at least it seems to me as if, the high chances are <laughs> that he was aware of that plotting and was quite possibly a party to it. It seems to me that perhaps rather than focus on Olaf, Olaf Scholz, a number of questions might be addressed to Jens Stoltenberg about what he knew and when did he know it and whether he knew about it before the war began, because bear in mind, all the planning started well before the war began, months before the war began, and whether he was aware of what was going on and was party to what he was going on whilst he was making all those windy statements about great issues of principle and about the threats that the Russians were supposedly posing and the military threats that Russia was supposedly posing and what role he may or perhaps may not have had, in assisting in this operation, which, as I said, according to Hirsch, was carried out under the cover of a NATO exercise. I just say, because, of course, Germany is a NATO member state, in fact, a linchpin NATO member state, very difficult to imagine, NATO functioning without Germany. So an attack on what is, after all, the energy infrastructure of 
a NATO ally and such a key NATO ally might be a curious thing for the Secretary of Gen General of NATO to be involved in. And I would go to say further that if Stoltenberg was aware of what was going on and was a party to it, and these are all very conditional phrases that I'm now making, then I'm going to look back on some of the things that he was saying in the run-up to the war and after the war in a very different light. Now, I'm going to add something else here, because, of course, one of the points that Hirsch makes is that the Norwegians have a deep dislike, even hatred of the Russians, something which I have to say um, rather troubles me. I mean, I'm not arguing that it is untrue, but I'm somewhat bewildered as to why Norway, of all places, should have this intense animus towards the Russians, but it does seem to be reflected in some of the language that Stoltenberg has been using. But Hirsch also says that the Norwegians were keen, or at least they were one of the motivations that the Norwegians had in this operation, in, in participating in this operation, was that blowing up the Nord Stream pipelines would work to Norway's financial interests because Norway would then be able to take Russia's place as the big supplier of natural gas to the EU. So there was a financial, or if you like, using a stronger word, a mercenary motive in Norway's actions. Well, I'd like to know whether that was true or not. And I'd like to know also whether Stoltenberg was aware of that more mercenary motive and might have shared it. After all, he's close, apparently, to Norwegian economic decision-making. As I said, there was discussions just a few months ago that after he ceased to be NATO Secretary General, he would travel to go back to Norway and take over the running of Norway's central bank. So again, if one of the reasons why Stoltenberg, if he did know about the attack on, Nord Street, on, on the Nord Stream pipelines, and I'm not saying that he did, just pursuing a train of thought here, if Stoltenberg knew all about that and also was aware that the Norwegians had a mercenary motive. I'm not saying it was the only motive, but part of their motivations, Hirsch says, were mercenary. They wanted to make money by they knew, blowing up these pipelines, which would enable them to become the principal gas exporter to the EU. If Stoltenberg knew all about that and shared in that motive, well, I'm going to treat all that windy rhetoric about principle, principles, about the rights of small countries, not just in a different light, but in a totally cynical way. It seems to me that in that case, Stoltenberg would have more than mere explaining to do. I would have said that his whole behaviour um, throughout this affair, which I've always found frankly, unbalanced, begins to look deeply cynical as well. So let's think, talk a little less about Scholz, who, as I said, I don't think was involved, and I don't think Hirsch suggests that he was involved. Let's focus instead on what the Norwegians were doing, and let's perhaps ask some questions, some valid questions, about what one particular Norwegian knew and when he knew it and what role, if any, he might have played, and that is Jens Stoltenberg. 
Now, let me reiterate again, in making all these points, I'm not making any claims. I don't know. Only Stoltenberg, or at least Stoltenberg, knows. <laughs> I don't. But these are questions which perhaps I think he ought to be asked and might care to answer. Of course, if he wishes, he can express the same denials that the White House has done. They're hiding behind, or at least they're relying upon, denials from spokesmen. None of the key players, not Sullivan, not Newland, not Blinken, certainly not President Biden, and importantly, not William Burns, the director of the CIA. None of them has come out and said that Hirsch's story was untrue. If Stoltenberg wants to reassure people like me, and I really talk about reassurance here because I don't want to jump to any <laughs> conclusions. If Stoltenberg wants to reassure me that he was not involved, then I think he should say so, say so himself. I think he should say clearly that he had nothing to do with this affair and that I think he should come out openly and say it himself and not hide behind spokespeople. Anyway, that's what I want to say about Stoltenberg. But there is someone else I want to talk about, and that is our old friend, the senior administration official, anonymous senior administration official. Now, in the run-up to the start of the conflict in February, there's an awful lot of discussions about um, sanctions. And I remember all those discussions that they were taking place at extraordinary and extravagant length, and we were being told about the kind of sanctions that um, the United States and its allies might impose. And there were various briefings that took place in the White House briefing room, except we were never told who the officials were who were conducting these briefings. The media, of course, in the United States knows. We don't know. I've no idea who these officials were. But there was one particular person, a senior administration official. And my impression was that this official was a very senior person indeed. He, and my recollection was that it was a he, he seemed to know a very great deal about what was going on. He was talking about the fact, as I remember, that the, in the event of a Russian invasion, as he put it, of Ukraine, the United States would go right up to the top of the sanctions ladder and would stay there. That was one phrase that this person used. But he also said some other things, and they were very interesting things. And let me repeat again, this was either in January or February of 2022. I don't remember exactly when. I think it was more like January than February. You can trawl through all the White House briefings, if you wish. Whether that particular briefing is still there, I don't know. Whether it's been edited, I don't know. But I clearly remember this interesting person coming along and saying, or rather responding to questions about what might happen if the Russians responded to the sanctions that the United States and its allies were going to impose, the sanctions which were going to be at the very top of the sanctions escalator, what would happen if the Russians then cut off energy supplies, gas supplies to Europe? Wouldn't this cause major problems for the Europeans? And this helpful person appeared to laugh the idea off. He said that, well, the Russians might do that, but the Russians are in a symbiotic relationship with the Europeans. Yes, the Europeans do need Russian gas, but the Russians 
need to sell their gas to the Europeans also, because this was their major source of revenue. And the implication was that if the Russians stop the flow of gas to the Europeans, their economy would go into an even bigger tailspin, in which case they would effectively be sanctioning themselves. And for that reason, they were most unlikely to do that. And for that reason, there was no real threat to energy flows from Russia to Europe, uh, of natural gas flows from Russia to Europe. As I said, you can, if you wish, go back, look through all those White House briefings. There's lots of them. I personally don't have the time to do that, but you can do it. You can probably find it. I'm absolutely sure that my recollection of this briefing is correct, and I remember making a program about it at the time. So, this person was, according to my memory, giving all of these reassurances. The Russians were most unlikely to cut off gas supplies to Europe because they were in this symbiotic relationship on energy with the Europeans. A symbiotic was this person's word, not mine. Um, all of this was being said at exactly the time when Hirsch tells us the Americans were already planning to blow up the Nord Stream pipelines. So, the US, this person, very well informed person, was going around giving assurances or reassurances, reassurances that would have been read in Europe, read perhaps in Germany, which were probably intended to be read in Germany. The Germany doesn't really need to worry too much about joining the United States in a giant sanctions war against Russia, because whatever Germany does, whatever the West does in the way of sanctions, is most unlikely to affect energy flows, gas flows from Russia because of the symbiotic relationship that the Russians were in when it came to these energy flows with Europe. <clears throat> so, a case of misdirection, a case of deception by the United States, no hint in any of these briefings that there were plans to blow up the pipelines. <laughs> um, who was this senior administration official? As I said, I, at the time, was deeply frustrated about the fact, actually puzzled about the fact, that this person, whoever he was, was hiding behind anonymity. I couldn't see the reason why that was the case. After all, the White House press call, which has been briefed by him, would have known his identity. I was unable to see why this person was hiding behind anonymity. Well, perhaps we now know why, because at the very same time, apparently, that this person was telling us that Europe was in a symbiotic relationship with the Russians on energy and that the Russians, for that reason, would be most unlikely to interrupt energy flows to Europe. His administration was planning to blow up the Nord Stream pipelines. Did this person know this? I think, again, we should know. I think whoever this person was... He should come forward, or if he didn't know, the media, or to who obviously, as I said, know who he is, they should be asking this person those questions. Did this person know that at the time when he was giving these briefings, 
the United States, the US government, the administration, the Biden administration was plotting to blow up the Nord Stream pipelines. I'm going to make a further point. Was this person one of the gang of three that was most deeply involved with President Biden himself in the plan to blow up the pipelines? Was it Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken, or Victoria Nuland? At the time, I have to say, I got the impression it was Jake Sullivan. Jake Sullivan, President Biden's national security advisor, person who was most intimately involved in all the decisions, both on sanctions and the person who was setting up all the working parties on the top floor of the executive office building that were, according to Hirsch, plotting to blow up the Nord Stream pipeline. Now, I want to stress, I don't know for a fact that this anonymous official was Jake Sullivan. It might have been someone else. And it may be that this person was speaking innocently, though I would say that even if this particular person was being entirely innocent and above board, the administration for which he spoke was not because he was talking on behalf of the administration and the administration was giving the impression that there would be, there was unlikely to be any interruption of energy flows from Russia, even as it was planning to make sure that gas flows from Russia came to a stop. Anyway, put all that aside, of course, if it was Jake Sullivan or some other member of the Gang of Three, then frankly, this person was engaging in I would say, duplicitous or dishonest briefings. And again, let me reiterate, what was said to the media at that time is was said not just to the media, the White House media. It's being read across the world, I was reading, <laughs> but it was also being read presumably in Germany it was being read by people like Chancellor Scholz and his senior officials. And it might have, to some extent at least, informed their decisions. <laughs> now, these are questions, and I want to stress again, these are simply questions. I don't know the answers to any of these questions. I don't know who was the person who carried out that briefing in the White House. I don't know what role that person actually played in any of the decisions that were made. I don't know what Stoltenberg's role was. Perhaps he didn't have any role. Perhaps he was kept out of the loop as entirely as I personally believe Olaf Scholz was. But these are, it seems to me, proper and legitimate questions. And the function of the media, and Stoltenberg, after all, holds regular press conferences, the function of the media is to ask the questions. Perhaps Stoltenberg will provide us with a fully convincing denial, in which case I'll accept it. Perhaps this senior administration official, whoever he is, was an entirely innocent party, and he was not engaged in any particular misdirection. But if you assume that I do, as I do, and I think most people around the world do, that Hirsch's story is essentially correct, and Hirsch is telling us that the industry, the oil and gas industry, has arrived at the same conclusions as he has done, then these, it seems to me, are important questions which should be asked. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say today. I'll be very interested to see whether these questions are asked. 
I doubt it, actually. And I'll be very interested to see if they are asked what the answers are. But I put them, I put them out there. They have been bothering me for a couple of days. We'll see what more gets said. As I said, that's me for the day. More, no doubt, tomorrow about the progress of the battles, and we'll see what is going on in various other places. And in the meantime, it remains, all that remains for me is to wish you all a very good day, remind you once more that you can find all our videos on our various platforms, um, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin, and Telegram that you can support our work via Patreon and subscribe star links under this video, that um, you can check out our shop, and get yourself the merchandise that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, and all of those things. And last but not least, to remind you that if you've liked this video, it'd be nice if you made that fact known by ticking the like button and perhaps checking your subscription to this channel. That's me for the day, more from me soon, and have a very good day.